Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we're at the start of the last day of the TechCon, and we hope we still have your full attention. Uh, we would like to apologize for the technical issues that we have been uh, facing with the playing of these videos, and we're working on resolving these issues throughout the day, so we might have an opportunity to play them uh, later on. Uh, in the meantime, and before moving uh, to the next session, I would like to introduce a few uh, additional pieces of information. Uh, firstly, I would like to share with you the results of the survey on blockchain from yesterday. So this is a technology that has been mentioned quite a few times during the sessions, uh, both yesterday and, and on day one as well. And according to your views, uh, the key obstacle to scaling the implementation of blockchain technology is the lack of government strategy. So this is what uh, you have uh, uh, responded with uh, during the polls. Uh, so something to, to think about and, and maybe take into consideration um, in your strategies. Um, today is also the last chance for you to win a set of CertScan br uh, branded Beats headphones. So in the activity feed, we will post an X-ray image and give you 90 seconds to find the anomaly or in other words, to contra uh, the contraband hidden in the cargo on the image. You cannot circle parts of the image or manipulate um, it in some other way. What you need to do is to type uh, your answer in the activity feed, describing where you think the contraband is hidden. The first correct answer will be rewarded. So all those that want to participate, please go to the activity feed now. Uh, where our colleague Scott will be posting uh, the image. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed this game uh, and I hope you're all back. We have a winner who we will be announcing a little bit later on. And with that, we will now launch a new technology related topic. Teleworking has not been on our agenda so far and we're looking forward to hearing about the experiences from customs and international organizations in moving to this new way of working, which the private sector is already well familiar with. This roundtable will be moderated by our Deputy Secretary General, Mr. Ricardo Trevino Chapa, who doesn't need any special introduction. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to Ricardo. You have the floor. Hello. Good morning. Good uh, afternoon, good evening. Thank you, Milena, for, for, your, for your words and for introducing today's uh, last day of the TechCon. Uh, I will go immediately to introduce a little bit of, uh, on the panel. Uh, uh, since uh, we have a short time uh, and I'm sure that we are gonna have a very interesting participation from, from, from our panelists. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented crisis that has affected WCO members globally, unleashing the power of technology and how it can allow stakeholders to stay connected and ensure that customs work continues in a safe and reliable manner. Additionally, government imposed measures such as lockdowns, social distancing and closures of non-essential businesses led to a boost in e-commerce including cross-border e-commerce, of course. This uh, surge in volumes impacts customs uh, daily work. And uh, this uh, 2020 WCO TechCon aims at sharing effective business solutions supported by innovative and cutting edge technology, helping customs in addressing the risks and threats during the pandemic and any similar crisis. So, we have today four uh, well-experienced panelists uh, and the objective of the discussion and their participation will be to uh, take a look and explore what have been the challenges and the benefits identified and how our customs and other stakeholders planning to work in the future. Our first panelist uh, is Mr. Joshua Polshar, is an OECD policy analyst and a strategic foresight practitioner 
He has been uh, working in the Observatory for Public Sector Innovation within the Public Governance Directorate. He designs and delivers interventions and processes to build anticipatory capacity in a range of settings and has experience working in over a dozen national governments and international organizations. Joshua has also authored books, uh, chapters on effectively deploying scenario planning in policy discussions and key drivers affecting the future shape of education. Our second panelist uh, comes from the C Swedish Customs Training Center. It's an ICT educator, Ms. Malin Hassel. She has worked for Swedish Customs Training Center since 2013 with a long background working with various technologies and tools for distance learning and development of pedagogical teaching method uh, methods and various universities in Sweden. Working as an ICT educator at Swedish Customs Training Center includes supporting teacher colleagues in their online teaching. And in recent years, one focus has been to inspire the use of digital meetings and conferences and support colleagues in the use of various digital tools. Our third panelist is Ms. Andrea Bright, is a member of the US Customs and Border Protection, CBP, executive leadership team serving as the Assistant Commissioner, Office of Human Resources Management. In her role, she is responsible for all aspects of human resources services, including recruitment and hiring, benefits, work-life programs, workplace safety, personal research, executive services, human resources business system, among others. Ms. Bright is accountable for directing the delivery of these services to 60,000 nationally and internationally dispersed uniformed and non-uniform employees who comprise the largest law enforcement agency in the United States. Prior to this, Ms. Bright had also served in a variety of key leadership positions at Office of Personal Management since 1996 in CBP, and she's a bachelor in psychology. And our fourth uh, panelist, she is a well-experienced uh, customs officer uh, from Nigeria. She's currently uh, working as Deputy Controller General in Nigeria Customs Service, Ms. Ronke Olahumoke uh, Olubiji. And uh, uh, Ms. Ronke, she's also currently our Vice Chair at the Permanent Technical Committee. So she has much experience in the work that we do in WCO. So we will start uh, uh, by uh, uh, giving our panelists uh, the floor. So I will start with uh, Mr. Joshua Polsharp from OECD, please, uh, for a five minute introduction on, on, his, uh, on his topic, please, Mr. Joshua. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak on this occasion. It's always a great opportunity to, to collaborate with the World Customs Organization. So I'll just say a few words about strategic foresight and uh, the discipline that, uh, that I practice and how it works and how we use it at the OECD to support the work we do, to support national governments and to support international organizations, including the WCO, uh, whenever we can. So strategic foresight is the ability of an organization to constantly perceive make sense of and act upon ideas of the future emerging in the present. So it's not necessarily about looking forward and thinking to try to predict the future. You don't need to be able to predict the future in order to succeed as an organization. And that's just as well because it's impossible to predict the future. And anyone who says that they can will, uh, will soon find uh, themselves proved wrong sooner or later. So strategic foresight is really about using our collective intelligence uh, to, uh, to engage in structured and participatory and uh, impactful dialogue. It helps us to respond to change faster in the present, to identify new opportunities and solutions, to create and build new visions of success, and to stress test our existing plans and the assumptions that they're built on. And I'll say a bit more about assumptions in a moment. 
At the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, we have a range of different ways to support organizations in building their anticipatory capacity, ranging from starter kits all the way up to much more in-depth analysis. And we're currently doing work with the governments of Ireland, Finland, Slovenia, and several others in order to, to, to promote that capacity. We also have an event coming up next week called Government Aftershock, which will bring together uh, dozens of events uh, distributed around the world on the 17th of November and a high level forum on the 18th of November, uh, which will include high level speakers, uh, including the president of Estonia, the prime minister of Serbia and Latvia to talk about some of the consequences and challenges that the current crisis has presented and potentially some of the opportunities as well. So what is the founding idea of strategic foresight? We believe that the future is not some kind of distant remote place that, uh, that we have to guess through the use of crystal balls or research through evidence-based practice, although uh, we do uh, we do recognize the importance and value of forecasting. We believe the future is already something that is emerging in the present. And therefore, in order to use it, we have to explore, understand and act in the present. Of course, there's, there's no point in understanding the future if you're not going to use it in the present. And that really means challenging the biases that are built into our organization's way of thinking. We might have expectations about what the future is going to hold. We might have wishful thinking about the kinds of future developments that our organizations would like to see, but uh, are maybe unrealistic or won't come to pass. And we may also indulge in a bit of groupthink in the way our organizations plan for the future, which, uh, which needs disrupting in the present if we're not going to find ourselves unpleasantly disrupted in the future. So we approach these things in various ways. We do horizon scanning, we, do, uh, we look at forecasting, we look at modeling, but we also do visioning. We create alternative scenarios, which are qualitative and fictional accounts of how the future might be different that we use to reframe and, uh, and uh, reshape our strategy in the present. And it all comes down to developing better judgment by understanding better what's going on, what's emerging around us, why it matters to us as organizations, what we can do differently, um, and what is, our, uh, what is our problem solving capacity. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there um, because uh, I know that we have limited time and I'm always happy to, to take questions and uh, just uh, uh, guide you towards the observatory's website uh, where you can find out more about our work, which is oe.cd forward slash opsi, oe.cd slash opsi. I'll hand back to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. And uh, we'll be back uh, with you for, for uh, a couple of rounds of questions, uh, definitely. Now I will hand the floor to uh, Ms. Hassel from uh, Swedish Customs Training Center. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, yes, I'm talking a little bit of my experience from my role uh, during the pandemic. Uh, as I am the person at the Swedish Custom that inspires and supports to all kinds of digital meters. meetings. I got many questions from colleagues who wanted and needed my help to transform their meeting courses, workshops and conference into Skype for Business, which is the tool we use. Though both me and several of my colleagues had a long experience of working from home we're starting to offer webinars in Mars with the aim of sharing our experiences and telling how we do it to those who never had worked from home earlier. 
it was many employees who never have brought their laptop from the office before uh, the pandemic. Because everybody who is employed at the Swedish Customs has their own laptop. And 98% of the Swedish citizens have internet connection at home. So the digital infrastructure in Sweden is good and we have good conditions for working from our homes, even if many never done it before. As we have an in-house IT department, we had a very fast and smooth transition. So there was not any technical issues. Uh, and after this summer, we even got to the offer to borrow screens, web cameras, headsets, keyboards, mouses, and even office chairs so that we can have a very good conditions in the work environment to continue working from home. So nowadays uh, I'm working with lots of support with meetings at the Swedish conference. Thank you. Thank you, Malin, for sharing this uh, apparently very positive uh, experience uh, for, for Swedish uh, customs. Uh, now we will hear uh, from uh, Ms. Andrea Bright. Uh, how was the experience for US uh, CBP? Uh, the floor is yours, Ms. Bright. Thank you. Thank you. I, first of all, I really want to thank um, the WCF for facilitating this important discussion um, as we all are facing COVID-19 and the continuing impacts. Um, I think that this panel is a really great opportunity for us to share, opportun share information across organizations and across countries. Um, and I appreciate that the panel includes representatives who have different perspectives. For me, I work in um, human resources management. So I'm really looking at the impacts of teleworking from a person side, from the human side and the impacts on our workforce. Um, as some of you may know, CBP, and as you mentioned before, CBP has 60,000 employees. So we're a very large organization. In the United States, we're actually the largest law enforcement organization in the entire country. So we have a very large workforce. Currently, on any given day, we have about 20 to 25 percent of our workforce teleworking which is a huge increase for us from the past. I will say that most of those employees who are teleworking are a professional workforce. So that includes um, our human resources staff, our information technology specialists, our analysts, um, some of our training folks, um, a wide range of employees. But we also continue to have employees on our borders, so on our front line. Um, that's one of the challenges that we faced in teleworking is identifying opportunities for those individuals to um, perhaps do some project work and, and shift in and out. We also have seen as, as everyone probably has a significant reduction in travel. And so what that's enabled us to do is shift some of our workforce who would normally be supporting travel. They're actually um, doing increased inspection. Um, so shifting to that um, side of the work where we're more able to have social distancing. So for example, in inspecting cargo and, um, and mail, those types of things. And as a result, we've seen a significant increase in seizures uh, across the board. So that's one impact that we have had. Um, on the technology side, which really isn't as much my side, um, we really have had a fairly seamless transition. However, um, just due to the increase in volume um, for I'm teleworking, I've been teleworking since March, and we have a large portion again of our workforce who hadn't been teleworking, but we've had to increase a lot of our, um, a lot of our bandwidth. We've had to increase um, some of our support from Microsoft and other providers. We do try to provide um, multiple collaborative tools to all of our workforce. So um, some folks are using Microsoft Teams, we're also using WebEx, we're using Skype. So um, leveraging as many tools as possible, we found that 
some tools work better for certain situations. Um, it really has been a learning curve for all of us and an interesting way for us to learn to connect with people remotely, um, something that we're used to doing in person and we're used to maintaining connections because we see someone in person. And so it really has been an exciting opportunity for all of us to learn to leverage some of the things that we've, le that we've learned from connecting remotely. So I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing these uh, challenges. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, uh, the the need to adapt uh, to this new to the, this new way of doing things. Now I will uh, hand the floor uh, to Miss uh, Olubiji from uh, the Nigeria Custom Service. It's uh, nice to see you again and say hi to you, Miss Olubiji. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, all. Nice to see you again, DSG. And I want to thank the entire WCO Secretariat for their great sense of commitment and also the management of WCO. So let me quickly give you a brief introduction. The Nigeria Customs Service, I must tell you, has evolved beautifully. Do you know 30 years ago, the nature of the operations of the service was strictly analog with manual engagements at every phase in the implementation processes of our duties. I want to tell you that this, what I've just said is just the representation of our past. We have since then journeyed a long way as most of our core functions today have been semi-digitalized. We are, however, still limited by current realities of inadequate infrastructure as a developing nation. The advent of the COVID-19 pandemic created a new reality of some officers working from home. A high level of adaptation is required to get the same level of commitment from our officers in the light of the new working developments. We cannot fight challenges, but I can tell you, we can only learn from them and come up with new strategies to readjust to the new normal. And so, even though the NCS cannot currently fully adapt to the, to adopt the teleworking because of the peculiar nature of our semi-automated custom statutory functions, the service is still able to partially utilize teleworking arrangements in administrative areas. Fine, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was initial fear and a lot of anxiety, but the NCS management was able to send medical teams to all commands and stations to sensitize our personnel and with the new information on how to stay safe and adhere to safety protocols as advised by the World Health Organization, there was a return of confidence. Instructions from management led to a tactical alternating of the workforce to reduce the number of officers on duty. We had extensive deployments and placements of signages for operators as well as establishment of sanitization infrastructure in all commands, automatic sanitization units, as well as temperature scanners. Removal of visitor seats were effected in all commands and brought to reduce the amount of people in our offices and workstations and to reduce the physical meetings. Uh, we also enforce the usage of masks, sanitizer, and hand washing um, stations, the unprecedented experiences. With the global COVID-19 pandemic have brought about a new normal in our style of procedures, as well as manners of engagement. 
some effects of the social distancing measures include the service being exposed to our capacity to operate minimally as certain functions were delegated to be performed off-site. Crowd control, which had been a problem with the volume of work always at the ports became drastically reduced as people were advised to adhere to the social distancing measures laid out. Teleworking became possible as a lot of functions were carried out via communication through phone calls, text messages, and other forms of instant messaging facilities like WhatsApp. To share the Nigerian experience during the pandemic, we cannot help but look at how the Nigerian Customs Service was able to maintain productivity in spite of the new normal presented by the challenges of the pandemic. For instance, the earlier upgraded, uh, the NCS earlier upgraded its automated declaration process to the Nigerian Integrated Custom Information System, known as NICES 2 where the importer customs agents could perform their functions fully online up to and including e-payment of taxes. That made the revenue collection marginally affected during the COVID-19 crisis. Secondly, collaboration with stakeholders and sister agencies to guarantee trade facilitation and supply chain continuity with reference to joint enforcement projects like the CRED initiative. This enhanced and enforced policy as encouraged, that has so much encouraged our importers to import the PPEs and other items needed to combat the spread of coronavirus with zero percent rate of duty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Luigi. And uh, yes, uh, definitely, I think we cannot avoid uh, uh, challenges. We cannot run from them, but we can learn from them. And I think that the uh, customs community and uh, the whole uh, global society is learning, uh, uh, learning a lot of lessons from the past uh, recent months. Uh, I will go back to, to Joshua from uh, OECD. Uh, uh, Joshua, your, your area of expertise is the strategic foresight. This is, uh, this is something in which WCO is embarking. And uh, this week we started with our first uh, regional workshop with the, with the MENA region. Your contributions were very well, uh, very, very welcome. Uh, we are continuing uh, the rest of our regions in the, in the, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, can you tell us more about it and how it is relevant in the context of uh, future jobs and employment? Uh, what, how, how can you link the foresight uh, exercise to the job and employment in, in, in the future? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So thank you. And I'm very pleased to be able to, to make the contribution such as it was to, to your regional workshops. Although what I would say to begin with is that exploring the future, understanding it, using it to reshape strategy, they're all things which require dialogue. We have an implicit sense of future, and I think that's also really important to underline it. It's not that organizations are not already thinking about the future. Of course they are. But in order to reveal and test our assumptions, we need dialogue. So I can start you with a presentation, but ultimately what, what really needs to happen is uh, for organizations to embed into their way of working, constant checking in dialogue and, uh, and calling into question the plans and, uh, and assumptions which, uh, which are being relied upon for a sense of future. Then in terms of, you asked me about the relevance of using strategic foresight for a particular policy domain, in this case, uh, uh, work and employment. Uh, that's something which we build into any strategic foresight intervention from the very beginning. 
setting out purpose of why you want to use the future. Because as I say, we don't we don't see the future as something um, objective and, and outside beyond our uh, beyond our, our knowledge. We see it as something that we access in the present. Any intervention starts with purposing. So if there is a particular set of policies or uh, strategies that in this case the the WCO is uh, is embarking upon that are related to the field of work and employment then that would be your starting point and we would start looking for changes in the present big deep set mega trends such as migration or aging populations but also some of the weaker signals of change, which might not be on the radar, but probably should be and have a chance of growing into something big in the future. The classic example we use there is if you think back to 2011, when the company Uber was uh, a fairly small scale operation, mainly based in the state of California, but had just started to receive its first round of venture capital funding. That was a weak signal for a big change that came about in the years coming. And there are already going to be many of those weak signals in our current environment. And uh, the, the question now is, is spotting them, not because we want to get the future right and know exactly which ones are going to grow big and which ones are going to fall away, but in order to pick out the ones which challenge our current way of thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua, for, for your comments. Uh, Ms. Malin, uh, you're currently participating in a work group for the EU Commission with a program for common learning with the aim of developing methodologies within digital way of working, for instance, webinars. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this initiative? Can you advance uh, some of the results that you see or how this is going to impact the, the near future? Uh, I give the floor to you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm a member uh, of uh, one of the five members in the project group. Uh, and the composition of the member group uh, is that we have ex experience in delivery and use of webinars. And the aim with the webinars is to reach widely spread and even large audience and save time and money. Instead of losing valuable working time when traveling to learning event, the participant just log in from their computer. So that's the biggest aim. Uh, so we have a common learning event program that we train participants on the specific technical and methodological competences needed to deliver EU training webinars. The training will include some theoretical parts, but mainly it will consist of interactive exercises. The learning by doing approach will be used and participants will have several possibilities to practice interactivity and will also deliver a short webinar with the tool Zoom that uh, we're using when we deliver the EU webinars. We should have had the common learning event in Portugal this September, but uh, we had to transform it. So we will have the next event uh, next week, and then we will have it in Zoom. And uh, the participants are tax or customs officers who is experts on their specific topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now going to, to, to Andrea uh, from uh, CVP. Uh, you were talking about uh, uh, 20 to 25 percent of, uh, of uh, CVP personal teleworking. So uh, from 60,000 uh, people uh, working in the, in the agency, that's a, that's a big, a big uh, part of it. Uh, how, uh, what specific challenges have you found there? And, but especially for, for, for those customs officers in the ground, how, how are, 
are these uh, people working and how are they evolving in, in the current circumstances? Thanks. Thank you. Um, one thing I do I want to mention as I start is um, kind of tying into the remarks from Sweden just a moment ago. We really have been pushed to conduct our business in new ways. So in addition to teleworking, we're looking at some virtual opportunities. We're looking at webinars and things like that. One of the most recent successes is that we developed our first ever virtual trade week. Um, to engage our industry through our commitment to transparency, through open dialogue and candid discussions about our pressing issues facing both CBP and the industry. We hosted this event live via webcast and we engaged nearly twice the number of attendees that we would normally have in our annual trade symposium. So we are seeing some um, positive benefits, which is interesting. Um, we probably without COVID would not have taken that approach. So there are some um, interesting changes in the way that we engage our trade partners. Um, and we're seeing that across the board. I will say we're seeing that in our workforce as well. Some of the training that we provide to our workforce and some of the engagements that we have that we previously limited to in-person attendance that might in the U.S. have meant that people were traveling significant distances to attend, which resulted in limitations in attendance, partly because of cost and partly because of time. Um, we are seeing a lot more attendance and interest in attending a lot of our virtual training sessions, which is, um, which is really a great, um, a great positive. Um, I will say on the um, challenges side, well, a lot of our workforce has teleworked a little bit for many years. A lot of us teleworked a day or two in the past, perhaps a week, something like that. Um, but really, that wasn't the case for senior leadership. Our senior leadership was very much um, expected uh, to be on site and Senior leaders also expected their their management teams to be on site. So historically, as we all probably have heard, many managers are resistant to telework. If I can't see my employees, how do I know that they're working? It's, it's what we've all heard for years. And as you know, many of us in the human resources community have said over the years, well, how do you know that they're working when they're sitting at their desk because you're not standing over them? So it's been really a forcing factor to have COVID-19 in terms of broader adoption of telework. One interesting aspect is that our leadership knows that we really have to model the behavior that we expect of our workforce. And even our commissioner and deputy have teleworked. They've developed a, an approach where one of them teleworks and the other is in the office. That never would have happened in the past. And so, um, I think it's critical in terms of adoption to have leadership demonstrate a model, the behavior that we're expecting to see. Um, if leaders are on site, then the expectation is that, you know, those who want to get ahead would be on site and you start having everyone feeling the obligation to be on site. What we have found from our senior leadership pushing into this is that um, they really have been I would say surprised um, at how effective our workforce has been when teleworking. It has been um, relatively seamless. There have been challenges, certainly, um, but I anticipate that in the future, um, as we consider where we are long term and what everyone keeps calling the new normal, we may not go back to. Um, the workplace exactly the way it was. I think we'll be looking at both the gains and costs of expanded teleworking. Um, one of the questions that keeps coming up is, what are we losing by not having the informal conversation around the water cooler? Um, what do we lose by not having people who don't necessarily work together run into each other in the hallway? and exchange information that wouldn't necessarily happen in a formal meeting. And in teleworking environments, it's a little bit harder and requires some intention in order to have those casual 
interactions where information is shared across disciplines, across organizations. Um, we tend to, in at least we're finding in the telework environment, that um, we don't have as many informal chats. We have a lot more formal structured meetings, but not the informal exchange. So we're starting to look at what are the people costs of teleworking? What do we lose from that? Um, are there different impacts for new employees? We've been onboarding or hiring our new employees over the last eight or nine months. And in my organization, um, within my own office, they have they came to the office to pick up a laptop and their ID, and they have never seen most of their colleagues in person because their colleagues were teleworking. So do those new employees really feel part of the organization? And what do we need to do as an organization to ensure that those employees really feel connected to our mission and to the rest of the workforce? So we're starting to look at all of those people costs, as well as I mentioned, some of the benefits. We know that we're able to engage um, a more geographically diverse workforce in a lot of ways, but there are some costs. So we're starting to look at costs. On top of that, I will say that we've also maximized a lot of workplace flexibilities to reduce the number of employees who are reporting to our ports of entry at any given time. For example, we've encouraged, um, and this, this really is um, a big change for us, telework for our customs um, inspectors to the extent that they can operationally make that feasible um, and looking at different types of work projects that can be done on their computers is one example. We've also granted flexibility as employees' work schedules. We used to have what we call core hours, which meant every employee was required to report. Um, there was some flexibility as to when they start and end, but there were certain core hours when every employee was required to be on duty. And we've modified that and allowed the supervisors to um, consider split shifts. So we have employees who are now working um, a few hours in the morning and then the rest of the day in the evening in order to um, support their um, children who are doing remote work, remote learning during the day. So we've really um, pushed the limits in terms of flexibility. Um, we also developed a new type of um, what we call leave. Um, we have each employee receives a certain number of vacation days and sick days, but we also, during COVID, are allowing employees to use what we call weather and safety leave. We typically use that for conditions where, for example, a port might be closed because of a blizzard or whatever the situation is. So that was a historical use, and we would allow employees to not have to use their own vacation day in that type of situation. But now we're using this for um, things like when an employee is required to self-quarantine or self-isolate. So they're not being charged um, to their own leave and losing their leave, their paid leave time. Um, so there are a lot of flexibilities, but I think overall, um, we're going to see differences in the way that we work in the future. And I'm excited to see what happens as a result of all this. So thank you. Thank you, Sprite. Really, really interesting all, all your points and the, the impact that uh, is having, for instance, in, in, in new recruited, recently recruited people that uh, don't know all of their colleagues, uh, at least not uh, face to face. and. Uh, how this uh, has a, a psychological impact. Uh, I will go uh, now uh, for uh, the, this uh, question to uh, Ms. Ms. Olubigi. Uh, you recently uh, was elected as vice chairperson of the WCO PTC, the Permanent uh, Technical Committee, and you assumed that role in the last meeting, which was concluded two weeks ago, uh, and that was held in a virtual mode. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, your experience, uh, how the, the Nigerian Customs Service is adapting to the new way of contributing to these kind of discussions, which are 
a high policy level discussions and uh, and and your your opinion on how also WCO is doing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the Nigerian Customs Service has taken some steps, among others, to fully adapt to this new virtual way of contributing to the management uh, discussions and decisions on NCS operations. This is done face to face, following every COVID-19 protocol as advised by the World Health Organization. Also via emails and postings on the intranet. We have also adopted some measures, instituting telework and telecommuting arrangements. That's quite new to our operations anyway. This was important to reduce the exposure levels to the entire staff population and also to maintain the social distancing guidelines being promoted. Virtual conferencing and meetings have become the new normal and the NCS is not left out. Discussions at the policy level and now online mandating everyone into the current reality of getting more things done in the shortest possible time. With working virtually, more decisions are made and executions are carried out instantaneously. Secondly, there was an upgrade of ICT resources for facilitating the technicalities of the virtual meetings. Provisions were made as well for various web conferencing resources like the external web for hosting and attending meetings via the WCO Kudo tool that we are using right now, WebEx platforms and other virtual conferencing platforms. We have also um, online training. The NCS service e-customs project awareness program was held virtually for managers and middle managers. We had discussions on the processes of automation at the operational level and strategic levels of management were held. We are on our way to e-customs in the next two, three years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for, for your uh, points and, and your views. Uh, we are almost getting there. Unfortunately, time is, is almost over. We are supposed to, to finish at, uh, at uh, one o'clock uh, Brussels time. Uh, so uh, before thanking our excellent, uh, great panelists, uh, I would just uh, like to, to highlight a little bit on, on, on what we've uh, heard. I think it was uh, really uh, enriching the different points of view that uh, we just had uh, during this, this panel. Uh, first of all, uh, the point of view from the foresight perspective uh, through the OECD expertise in which uh, for, 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 for such an exercise, uh, uh, Joshua uh, said, the first thing is to consider the present and find some um, signs of mega trends that could uh, that could influence uh, the future. So, is is what's happening today a big, huge mega trend? Is this more than a sign? Probably uh, all that we're seeing, teleworking, webinars, uh, everything is is going online. So, uh, probably this is is something that uh, might uh, help uh, all institutions, organizations plan. Their, their way of working in the future. And we've heard also in a practical manner how the Swedish uh, customs service, the Nigerian customs service and customs border patrol from the US have uh, uh, tackled and faced the different challenges and how they have uh, converted all these uh, current situation into opportunities. Uh, of course, there are several uh, differences uh, from the Swedish uh, case in, in which uh, all of the, the, the people had their own laptop and 98% of Swedish uh, citizens are having access 
to internet, uh, to, to other uh, situations around the world. Um, of course, uh, uh, there are different uh, levels of maturity and development, and each one of us has to adapt to our current circumstances. Uh, the great challenge faced by CBP with uh, being the largest uh, law enforcement agency in the US and, uh, and, and the challenge people are facing uh, psychologically and also physically in the new ways of, of, of working and how we have to adapt to this. And also the progress made by the Nigerian Customs Service in the last 30 years going from an analog uh, service to a completely digital service and 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 this has uh, definitely helped the Nigerian customs service to adapt to new circumstances and being prepared for this so this call all of us to be ready and to prepare for uh, coming scenarios by a foresight exercise in which we can uh, not forecast because foresight is not forecasting that was very clear but at least plan for different scenarios we can be ready we can be prepared for uh, uh, situations that will uh, take us to uh, evolve and to adapt to new trends and to coming threats. I thank you all for your patience. I thank uh, our panelists for their great contributions. This was a great discussion. I hope this is uh, uh, something that has really uh, uh, contributed to fulfilling the objectives of this tech con. Uh, 2020. Thank you all. I wish you a good uh, uh, rest of the of the of the of the conference. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, and a big thanks to all the speakers. Uh, it was very interesting to hear our fellow customs colleagues and and others. The, and to see how they have adapted to the new way of working during these uh, very unusual circumstances. Uh, now I would like to announce the winner of the third pair of the headsets in the Find the Contraband game. Uh, the winner is Harry Satya Nugroho. Uh, I would like to inform all the winners that they will be uh, reached out to by our colleague Natasha regarding the delivery of the prize. Uh, and now before moving to the next block of sessions, uh, we turn to another video break now provided by Microsoft. More than ever, businesses are looking for ways to be agile and save time and money. Microsoft Teams is a rich platform for work, offering so much more than just chat, meetings, and calling. With Power Platform in Teams, it's also a place where anyone can develop simple yet powerful low-code solutions that simplify work right within Teams. Power Apps is a low-code app building platform that lets you easily create, edit, and publish apps directly to Teams, allowing you to simplify work across any device. Now, anyone can benefit from AI-powered, natural language-capable bots made right in Teams. Power Virtual Agents makes chatbots easy to create and scale across your organization. You can automate processes like approvals, reminders, and even robust enterprise-grade workflows using the Power Automate app. And turn your insights into action with a new Power BI app that lets you quickly find, share, and create data visualizations right within Teams. With Teams and Microsoft Power Platform, your opportunities to simplify work are endless, making it easier than ever to bring people together and achieve more.
So I think at this point, this is definitely a sea change. The amount of changes that have happened in medicine in the last two weeks are like more than I would have expected in like two decades. We have rolled out teams across our network and we went from essentially no televisits to approaching 5,000 visits a day in the last week. You connect with them via a video visit. The partner actually can interact and hear the counseling that's done and provides them with an additional layer of reassurance. These visits are surprisingly intimate. And I can actually share my screen and show the x-rays. Five, 10 minutes and we were done and she could go outside and play with her kids. So via a video visit, we save a mask essentially with every visit. You consider that almost 13,000 masks from an outpatient perspective. From the clinical aspect, it allows us to continue to take care of the patient. So we still can provide prenatal care. We really moved some mountains in our network and uh, none of it was done in person. We were able to use Teams to train people on the app. I think we trained 1,900 people in three days. That is pretty amazing. Well, so I don't know how we would have accomplished all this uh, without using Teams. Completely agree. This is going to be a game changer for medicine. We are running our COVID-19 technology response on Teams. Teams has given us the possibility to continue to innovate. I can bring them in. I can actually share my screen and show the x-rays. We're living on Teams. It's as simple as that. Cortana, join the meeting. Cortana, add Megan to the meeting. Hi, Megan. Let me share the presentation. See it? Okay, great. We are running our COVID-19 technology response on Teams. Teams has given us the possibility to continue to innovate. We're living on Teams. It's as simple as that. So welcome back. Uh, today in the polls, we have posted two questions for you. And I would like to invite you to answer these questions which you can find under the main menu on the event Mobi platform under the tab polls and service. So the first question is which area of technology can contribute to enhance resilience in the future? And the second question is which topic you have enjoyed the most during the TechCon? Your answers will be very important to us. So please take a minute to answer the poll. I would like now to introduce the interviewer of our next four one-on-one -on -one sessions, Ms. Chris Thibodeau, CEO of T-Tech Incorporated. Chris has over 30 years of experience in border security, risk assessment, customs modernization, and the design and development of automated targeting system. He has worked for the United States firm's Green Lane Systems, AT Solution, and PAE. Chris previously held leadership roles in enforcement, operations, and major projects with the Canada Border Services agencies. Chris also worked for USCBP. Since 2016, Chris has acted in the role of Chief Executive Officer for TTEC Incorporated. Chris, you have the floor. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, the wonderful introduction and the opportunity to moderate uh, topic five here on our agenda today. Um, we should probably move quickly because I think we've only got 40 minutes uh, for this session. Uh, and just to recap what this session is about, uh, this is a topic in regards to uh, many administrations are working from home as a novelty. What we have, uh, what, we've been, what have been the challenges and the benefits identified and how are customs planning to work in the future? Uh, the last panel I found very informative, uh, led by the DSG uh, from the WCO, great discussions, great insight. Um, 
great way to kick off this topic with um, a lot of wonderful insights and questions answered from Sweden, from the OECD, uh, from U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and Nigeria. So those were uh, some very insightful discussions and, and uh, conversations on this topic. Uh, in continuing this topic, we're going to invite representatives from Mauritius, from the Asian Development Bank, uh, from the UN uh, Economic Commission for Europe, and from Panama. So we've got a very diverse panel to continue the discussion on remote working uh, during times of COVID. Uh, again, we've only got 40 minutes, so I don't want to waste too much time, but just uh, as a brief uh, introduction to the topic, um, as, as our company, you know, we've been working remotely, you know, pretty much from the inception of T-Tech. Uh, we do our development in Vietnam, as an example. Uh, we work all over the world, in the Caribbean, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia. Uh, our, our headquarters are in Barbados, but many of us work in Canada and the United States and Australia and New Zealand and, and the UK, as examples. So for us, it's pretty been, you know, much a, a normal course of action to just continue working remotely during times of COVID, but I completely understand having been a public servant, how can this can be such a, a drastic change for public servants and for government workers to, you know, prepare business continuity plans during times of crisis um, and, and de determining what, you know, critical and are, uh, and if customs, you know, which we all believe is a critical and essential service to keep trade moving. Um, you know, this is a very important topic. So in moving on here for uh, just to introduce uh, our, our, um, our next speakers, um, just to give you an overview of who they'll be, we have Mr. Sharan Debising from the Mauritius Revenue Authority. We'll have Mr. Nigel Moore from the Asian Development Bank, uh, Ms. Maria uh, Rosaria uh, Cicciarelli uh, from the uh, UN uh, Economic Commission for Europe, and Ms. Tanya Yvonne Barsalo, uh, who is the Director General of Panama Customs. So our first speaker uh, will be Mr. Sharan Debising. He's from the Mauritius Revenue Authority. He's an internationally oriented professional with more than 18 years of experience in the field of ICT, capacity building, trade facilitation and management. He's worked in various countries, including Mauritius, Singapore, and sub-Saharan sub -Saharan African countries. He's worked at the World Customs Organization as a lead expert for e-learning and capacity building under the World Bank funded project in the sub-Sahara Africa region. He's currently the assistant director at the Customs Department of Mauritius, heading the IT department, as well as the project manager for the National Single Window Project in Mauritius. Uh, recently, he's been implementing the teleworking at the Mauritius Customs uh, Service earlier this year, and he's proved very useful during COVID curfew period in Mauritius. So without further ado, Mr. Debising, I will turn the floor over to you. So basically, um, it's a real pleasure for me to talk to you on this uh, important topic, uh, which is teleworking. Uh, basically, um, in Mauritius, it has been a real drastic change for many customs officers, basically to to work from home, to, uh, to clear consignments, customs declar through the customs declarations, um, especially during this lockdown period. So uh, we we have been able to see many benefits of this project of teleworking uh, in Mauritius. Uh, basically, we we have been able to uh, overnight, I would say, we have been able to. Uh, to hook around 200 customs officers working from home and releasing, you know, very important consignment, especially during this curfew period. And uh, in terms of flexibility, we have seen like many benefits we got through this teleworking. Basically, in terms of flexible of hours of our officers to work, so it's a it's a it's a longer hours of work, and uh, we have also seen um, that uh, in terms of of supervisory control uh, of our officers. Uh, it is really uh, interesting to be able to track the work of our customs officers and basically to, uh, you know, to set time frame and to do su proper supervisory control and, and, and even, even target, uh, do more analysis on, on risk management uh, at the customs uh, level. And 
The other benefit we have seen basically uh, is the adoption of, of you know, technology uh, within our organization. Basically, we have automated many of our processes in Mauritius customs and uh, uh, giving um, you know, uh, clearance from home. That is, for the use of technology has become has has actually been very successful and our people has been able to 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 to, to adopt this new strategy uh, within a really short time frame obviously uh, we had a lot of challenges and uh, especially because of 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 you know uh, literacy in terms of ICT for our senior customs officers but we have been able to tackle that by creating you know uh, a group of super users, that is, uh, those who are, you know, very well versatile with technology, to give support to the um, to the to the team, to the to the customs officers working from home, how to you know how to connect, how to use the system from home, and what are the security um, uh, features they have to you know uh, have to 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 address uh, basically when they are working from home. The other resistance we have seen challenges is basically the use of their own, you know, IC equipment, laptops. Although it was very minimal, but uh, in the next teleworking, what we are proposing is basically to provide the relevant ICT equipment and, 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 and connectivity to our customs officers. And during the recovery period, we didn't have the chance to, you know, to, to procure the right one. So basically they were using their own uh, uh, laptops or mobile device at home to connect. And uh, other challenge is basically is in terms of risk of security breach. Uh, as an ICT professional, basically we really look into and making sure that our people are well connected and there's no, uh, you know, we can't guarantee that, but we make sure that we use the proper equipment to ensure that there is uh, basically a, 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 a control in terms of connection and, and uh, monitoring uh, through the remote connection uh, on the systems at customs. We got very good feedback from our economic operators on the ground. Basically, uh, we are only the one major authority which was working during the COVID curfew period, you know, releasing consignments. The other ministries and other agencies uh, were there, but was not fully involved like what customs was doing basically, and uh, and and there is also a kind of duty officer duty hotline uh, team basically which was working twenty four by seven to ensure that consignments are being delivered. There's no issues of you know uh, encountered by the operators, especially when they have to you know to discharge like uh, medicines and you know uh, basic needs and all that. And this really went well. We also can I just like, give you one more one more minute, Mr. Debisi? Yes. And just, uh, just one minute to summarize, please. It has really been working successfully in Mauritius, and uh, we are planning, even the IT team right now, and and some of the dissections in in the MRE are already or continuing working on teleworking, uh, and we have seen this to be very successful and bring a lot of trust to our people and confidence to work with technology. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Mr. DeVisi. Uh, seems pretty clear that uh, business continuity planning uh, is critical during times of crisis and certainly within this pandemic. And I think we're gonna continue to see that many countries and their federal, federal departments and agencies have had to establish business continuity plans. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Nigel Moore. And Mr. Nigel Moore is from the Asian Development Bank. He's the consultant for the lead of the Carrick Advanced Transit, working on international trade facilitation and tax administration capacity building projects in over 30 countries in Central and Southeast Asia, Africa and the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, the European Union and the Middle East. Funded by the Asian Development Bank, U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, USAID, World Bank, the European Commission, UK Department for International Development, Inter-American Development Bank, and individual governments. So this is a considerable amount of experience that we have here uh, with us today. 
Uh, and again, without further ado, uh, Mr. Nigel Moore, if I could give you five minutes, uh, please, to discuss this. Mr. Nigel Moore might be having some difficulty connecting. Uh, if that's the case, maybe we'll just continue moving along and along here in the interests of time. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Ms. Maria Rosaria Cecciarelli. By the way, we'll check back with you, Mr. Moore, here in a, in a moment, but we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, who is Ms. Maria Rosaria Cecciarelli. She's from the uh, she's the chief for trade facilitation section for the um, uh, United Nations. Economic Commission for Europe. And she has more than 23 years of experience in international trade, where she's been the Chief of Trade Facilitation Section uh, in the UN ECE. She is responsible, among other, other uh, initiatives, for the United Nations Center for 1,300 experts working on trade facilitation and e-business projects to produce trade facilitation recommendations and e-business standards that can foster growth in international trade and related services. Under her supervision, UNC FACT is working at the moment on more than 30 projects on trade facilitation and e-business across the all value chain, including projects on blockchain and Internet of Things. Ms. Rosaria Ciccarelli, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, I lead the, the trade facilitation section uh, uh, in the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, I, I was asked to uh, speak on uh, how in the UN family we, we have been coping uh, uh, with this new way of working. So what I can tell you is that uh, it was a very quick uh, shift and very sudden. Uh, from uh, the human contact that we were used to have all the time uh, in the Palais des Nations and in, in, the, in the International Geneva, we are something like uh, more than 2,000 uh, uh, international uh, uh, officials. And suddenly we all went home and working from home. Uh, in my organization, we were pretty lucky because uh, this shift had already started long, some time ago. Uh, because there was this policy of teleworking. Uh, that's why the major part of us were ready with equipment uh, and uh, uh, we could immediately, as of mid-March, in one week we were all uh, able to work from home. And uh, what I can tell you, and this is something that Andrea uh, before mentioned during the, the previous panel, was uh, Working from home was not the problem. Uh, our work suddenly uh, doubled, if not tripled, uh, because everybody was at home, everybody was willing to work and to connect with colleagues. The problem was the human contact. This missing, uh, you know, uh, we are all away from our family here. Uh, our colleagues uh, are a bit our social networks. And what's happened was that these social networks at one point was not there anymore. Um, and this was kind of the negative point. For the rest, uh, all of us were immediately connected to, to Teams, uh, WebEx, go to meeting, and we could continue our work. But as soon as in June they said, okay, you can slowly come back to the Palais de Nation, that is our UN house in Geneva, uh, we saw that people were more and more willing to come back. And even now that we are confined once again, uh, you still have uh, some staff, including me, that uh, resist and come back to the office, keeping the distances, keeping the mask, and etc. All our intergovernmental meetings have been moved uh, online uh, with no major problem, and now uh, uh, we are using this hybrid way, uh, using Anthropifying or Kudo, uh, so that the meetings can also be uh, translated. Um, and uh, what I've seen in my work, uh, we work, well, uh, in, in my section there is the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. 
uh, we had an, a massive amount of expert, more than ever. Uh, we passed from 1,000 experts to almost 2,000. Uh, and there you see really, first of all, the willingness of people to connect. And then, of course, you know, what we, uh, the argument that we treat are uh, digitalization, uh, e-certificates, uh, and uh, it was clear that there was a very strong need the use of new technologies uh, to come online and exchange information and exchange knowledge and, um, and go on new paths. So if I can look at the challenges of this uh, COVID period, uh, for sure uh, there is this uh, very sudden push to the use of technology. Uh, in even uh, developing countries, uh, transition economy quickly realized that if they were not going uh, to speed up with this, they were not going to cope. Um, this has been painful. We have supported our uh, developing and tran transition and economy countries uh, uh, to, to be up to the challenge. Uh, but uh, we have seen that this went very, very fast. We have been trying for years, for example, uh, to, to push for the use of e-certificates, especially in some, uh, in some areas where it's more difficult, like uh, phytosanitary agencies. And then uh, suddenly this was coming very fast and uh, uh, we had the request to create, uh, uh, for example, a task force for the use of uh, uh, electronic uh, CIDES permit, uh, endangered species. And, uh, and using new technologies, exchange these uh, certificates. Country immediately realized that if they don't use this kind of means, uh, they were risking to block their economy and their trade. And, uh, and, and, and this was more than necessary for them. The drawback is this human contact, uh, this exchange uh, that uh, you cannot have uh, through internet, for example, one of our meetings, that is a forum where normally have 500 participants, participants around the world, it did take place online, but they exchanged the networking among our experts, exchange of uh, information between uh, uh, experts that come from all over the, the world, uh, over coffee or, or during this period was not possible anymore. And then the other big problem for us was uh, as for our uh, partner in the, the WTO um, Trade Facilitation Agreement Annex D was the possibility to continue to run capacity building projects. Uh, suddenly we couldn't travel uh, in our beneficiaries countries, uh, we couldn't be next to them and explain them, uh, support them. So we had to reinvent uh, our way of working uh, for capacity building and even support them in another way because their priority were on uh, uh, recovery after COVID or coping with COVID uh, and we couldn't do it in the country. So there we really needed to change our, our way of working through um, trying to build this uh, remote contact that was not all the time easy uh, because internet was low uh, in, uh, in a lot of developing or transition country. Uh, and we could manage this mainly trying to find local consultant that could then have the contact, straight contact with us. And we have seen that even in this context, in a couple of months, uh, even the, in, in this situation, there was a possibility to adjust the way of working, even if we are all willing to go back to, to, to in a way, to a part of this uh, old way of working. Could you and, summarize, please, in, in one minute, Maria, please? Yes. So, well, I, I think I covered the point uh, that uh, I was asked to cover. And um, if you have any, any more that you want to ask. Thank you so much for uh, your insight there, Maria. Uh, we'll keep moving along just again in the interest of time. Uh, our session is quite short. Uh, we're still trying to connect with Mr. Nigel Moore. 
he'll join us if he's able to connect. Um, we'll be moving along here uh, to our next speaker, who is Ms. Tara Yvonne Barcelo. She's the Director General of the National Customs Authority in Panama. And Ms. Barcelo has practiced uh, for more than 19 years as a trial attorney and consultant on migration, security, and business entrepreneurship. She's held the positions of the Deputy Director General of the National Migration Service, in which she was in charge of the drafting, dissemination, discussion, and implementation of new immigration legislation and the develop development of the institution's international projects. She's been the legal advisor, advisor to the Vice Minister of Government and Justice. Uh, she's graduated in law and political science from the University of Panama. She's obtained a master's degree in international legal affairs from the American University uh, Washington College of Law. So we're very lucky to have such a brilliant legal mind uh, to join us as part of this discussion. So over to you, um, Ms. Barcel. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you to the WCO and TechCon for the opportunity provide to Panama to be part of this webinar. And thank you to all the colleagues and uh, all the uh, team that is working on to have this uh, conversation. Um, uh, during COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, Panama definitely have implemented a work at home initiative. And actually, uh, for some reason, our government uh, established and regulated a law on mid-February 2020. Like, I don't know why, but it, it was perfect, perfect timing for establishing the law. And that work regulated the teleworking. So uh, we were prepared legally for teleworking, but uh, people were not prepared in their minds to uh, to work at home. So uh, this initiative uh, did impact to public servants. Regarding Panamanian customs, uh, we have more than 20% of our staff uh, teleworking. Uh, the total of uh, number of custom officials that have taken advantage, advantage of this teleworking modality, it's almost um, uh, twenty percent of our staff and Polex officials who avail themselves of the teleworking modality must comply also with all the measures for protection of data belonging to the uh, National Customs Authority, based on ICT tools. Th that is important because uh, even though we are working uh, at home, we have to maintain certain measures of protection because we are a security organization that uh, manage uh, information. So this is an issue. Also, uh, this law was regulated uh, on September 2020 and uh, the the, the staff have the right to disconnect the worker in, in his time off. Uh, there is extraordinary telework days governed by the Labor Code of Panama. Uh, there is a professional risk include for those that occur in the place of or place of teleworking services. That's uh, something new. The employer must supply the tools, equipment, and computer programs for the for the staff. The installation of any type of computer program that violates the privacy of the worker or his or his family is prohibited by tele by working at home. The employer will bear the expenses related to electricity and internet public services required by the staff. So these are issues that are being regulated, that are different, that that needs uh, to be uh, adjusted. What are the advantage and disadvantage of teleworking? Uh, advantage, uh, flexibility in working hours, the time spent 
moving from the residence to the workplace, that is reduced, <laughs> and a greater concentration and tranquility when being at home. Depends if you have small kids that, that, or, or pets that, 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 can, <laughs> that, that cannot be so tranquility. And the disadvantage is that employees may require training to, to go ahead. Sometimes the internet services does not allow the employees to carry out their work from home without constant interruptions. The organization of teamwork is sometimes complicated. Uh, the decrease of productivity, learning new tasks or method methodologies can be reduced. These are some of the advantage and disadvantage of teleworking. And finally, um, our biggest uh, challenges, I think, is the it's it's um, receiving the the compromise from uh, the people to work as many hours and with the same objective as if you were working uh, at the office. Uh, it's very challenging also for custom services because we have a lot of contact with, uh, with territorial areas and uh, teleworking mostly it are for staff that had been in the, in the office but still we have uh, people working 24 seven in a, every entry of the country borders and in ports and in areas where it's difficult. Uh, also, we, there is a lot of um, challenges that we have been overcome with digitalization of the processes and uh, all our tax cost, uh, customers and users are really uh, satisfied with the change that we have done in such a small term of time. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. That was uh, that was great. Okay, uh, so moving along, I mean, if there's any questions that anybody in the audience has, please post them to the messaging board. Uh, I did see, I think, one up there. Um, and I've got a couple here, possibly, that maybe we could um, ask our, our current panel. Um, maybe I could uh, ask Sharon. Um, just commenting on um, working on sensitive, protected, or classified information. Um, we should probably consider that requirements for managing information are the same whether working remotely or in the office and whether connected to uh, a virtual private network or not. Uh, and assuming we must be mindful of managing information appropriately and effectively and in accordance with all relative legislative and policy requirements, um, we need to ensure that government information is appropriately managed and protected. Um, so do you have any other thoughts or suggestions on how we can ensure the security and proper handling of sensitive information? And uh, could I direct that question, please, to Mr. Sharon Devising, please? Uh, the floor is yours to give us an answer, please. Maybe uh, in two minutes, if you don't mind. So thank you. Uh, basically, that's a that's the most sensitive part of, of teleworking, and uh, I would say uh, basically during uh, the lockdown period, we have been uh, we have been working on the virtual private network, and basically all connections, uh, all the from home, it's we 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 basically authenticate the connections, and we also moving towards uh, using one-time password. Basically, when you try to connect and you get a one-time password to ensure that we know that it is, it's really, it's a customs officer who is connecting uh, to our system. And it goes to a, another level of security, which we call it uh, on our active directory. Basically, it's a quite technical term, but it's basically to authenticate the user or the use of the system. And, uh, and, um, and, and the moment they connect to that, uh, the PC at home, basically, they cannot access the internet. They can't do anything else because they are basically 
working directly on the system. It's as if they are working in the office. So they are not allowed to use the internet connections. All the USB connections, everything is being locked on their on their on their on their on the workstation at home. So this is the security we have been put in place. The only challenge is basically where we this is where the trust comes in our customer service is that when they're clearing a consignment, they are doing it uh, you know with integrity. There's no you know a broker or an economy operator sitting next to them and you know looking at the screen or whatever so basically uh, it's it's a question of this is where integrity ethics and code of ethics and 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 the trust we have in our customs officer to make sure that we are working you know honestly uh, at home but in terms of connectivity we make sure that there's a monitoring a very big monitoring uh, basically uh, from our IT team and those connections of customs officer after working hours we, we report this, especially when we say custom service connecting midnight. So there's a report which goes to the supervisor. You know, we need, we request some clarification why this guy has been connecting, you know, after working hours. So okay. basically, great, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And uh, this is in regard to inspections at the border. Um, there's a number of questions around the inspection process. Uh, um, in terms of how COVID-19 is affecting border processing and number of inspections. So I think in summarizing several questions that are on the chat screen, uh, is there uh, any um, hindrance in performing inspections based on the number of inspectors that could be at the border? Uh, I know that in North America, uh, you know, border uh, operations in both the US and Canada is a critical service. Trade must keep flowing. Uh, just for the information of most people in the audience, the Canada-U.S. border remains closed uh, for COVID-19, uh, for the COVID-19 situation in terms of regular day-to-day -day travel, except for essential workers uh, that do travel back and forth across the border because their job is on the other side of the border, and obviously for the flow of commercial trade uh, for consumption in both countries. So uh, that requires you know, uniformed officers at the border, but you know they're working day-to-day -day as they always did with masks, with hand sanitizer, uh, social distancing and so on, but that key flow of trade in North America uh, is important to uh, to be maintained across uh, the world's largest shared land border. Uh, not just, uh, you know, it's a perspective uh, from my end here, uh, sitting in Canada right now. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll direct that question to uh, to Tara uh, Barcelo, the DG of Customs, since we do have a, a customs uh, expert, the Director General on our panel. Um, Maybe you can give us just a, a one minute, uh, two minute maximum answer in terms of how um, border inspections might be infected uh, in a place like Panama. Thank you, Chris. Uh, definitely, it's a challenging and um, in our borders, what we have increased is the profiling of the risk analysis of uh, all the containers through Panama, we have more than 7 million of containers coming and going through our hub, logistic hub. And it, so imagine, <laughs> imagine re checking 7 million of containers. That's why we have uh, increased our, inter, uh, our um, exchanging of information with other countries. We have increased our risk analysis personnel in order to have a better profiling of the cases. And once we profile the, the case that we need to check through the scanners and the non-intervention uh, non checking, we um, have a protocol and a manual to the proceedings of checking the merchandise in the at, at least in the containers, that it's uh, what we do the most. We have more than five ports uh, in Panama, in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. That means that we have the mostly transborder of containers through one side to the other uh, that reduce the time and facilitates the time. And we want to uh, maintain competitive on the on, on our on our work and custom cannot be cannot be um, uh, something that can uh, avoid this facilitation. Uh, in that order, 
what we do is that uh, we have capacity uh, building with our staff in order to help them to do the work in a shorter time in a most professional way and uh, with a change of more information. Thank you. You have to unmute your phone. Your No, what about now? Can you hear me? Oh, okay, great. Uh, with that, uh, I guess we're out of time. I uh, wanted to thank our panel um, uh, for some, some wonderful discussion here in, in regards to this topic on remote teleworking during times of crisis. Um, it's pretty clear that plans generally consist of procedures to guide a department or agency to respond, recover, resume, and restore a predefined level of critical service delivery during and following a disruption, such as a pandemic. Uh, and in many countries, we've learned all work sites, you know, are, are being asked to work remotely wherever and when, whenever possible. And managers are expected to identify an approach that is flexible while ensuring continued critical government operations and services to their citizens. So I wanted to thank the WCO for this opportunity and uh, hopefully you found today's discussion insightful. And with that, I will close this discussion and pass the, uh, the floor back over to the WCO. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, we really regret uh, that our speaker, Nigel Moore, was not able to connect successfully. Uh, I was looking forward to hearing more about uh, the ADB experience uh, on this topic, maybe if there's an opportunity later on. We will, however, now need to, to move on, and uh, we will play a video provided by Indonesia Customs. Uh, if all goes well, this time next year, we will be seeing you all in person at the Technology Conference in Bali, organized with Indonesia Customs as our co-host. Located between the continents of Asia and Australia, and between the Indian and Pacific Ocean. Indonesia is the largest archipelagic country in the world, consisting of 17,504 islands. Because of its geographical and geological history, Indonesia is blessed with mega diverse fauna and flora, with a high number of endemic and ecological highly adapted species. Indonesia also offer you a fairy tale like landscape from azure seas, pristine jungle to volcanoes. Having its capital in Jakarta, Indonesia become the fourth most populous country in the world with a total population of nearly 270 million. As a diverse country, Indonesia is home to more than 700 different ethnic groups a thousand of local languages and numerous religions with the nation motto Bineka Tunggal Ika or unity and diversity. We live in harmony among tribes, religions and race. I am Sri Mulyani Indrawati, the Minister of Finance of Republic of Indonesia. I would like to invite you to come and enjoy the wonderful Indonesia as well as exploring the benefit of WCO Technology Conference that will be take place in Bali, known as the Land of Gods. Bali appeals through its exotic temple and palaces. It's set against stunning natural backdrop. The local festivals and art are enough to captive you into a never leaving this magical island. I would like to welcome you to Indonesia. Really impressive. We all look forward to the Bali conference. And now we move to the last topic of our tech con, which is how to build resilience for the future. While you are listening uh, to the panel session, please take a minute to reply to the questions in the poll. 
and the post and service tab on the event Novi platform. As the first question is uh, very much related uh, to the topic of the next session. I would like now to introduce the moderator of this session, Mr. John Main. John is the chairperson of the WCO Private Sector Consultative Group. He led the efforts to organize and is the executive coordinator of the Alliance for Modernization of Logistics and Foreign Trade, or PROCOMEX. The PROCOMEX Alliance is a coalition of over 85 business associations with the common objectives of increasing the competitiveness of Brazil by modernizing the country's customs processes. John, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Viara, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation from the WCO for the PSEG to chair this session, the sixth and the last session of this very well-organized event. Congratulations, Milena and Viara, for the organization. I have a, a very high-level panel, uh, which I would like to invite to be, be, uh, share this virtual space with me. And uh, I will introduce the panel uh, and and I would ask the panelists to, to join uh, with me. And then I will introduce each panelist and we will uh, the, conduct the panel itself, which has the objective of looking into the question of how to build resilience for the future. Uh, we, will, we have been invited to discuss the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and how to better prepare for any future disruption. Kleiner, uh, nicht durch die ganze, also nur uh, noch mich und nicht den ganzen Tisch. Please turn off your mics, your microphones. Colette, your microphone is on. I'm, I know it's you because it was in German and I think you're the only German speaker in the group. But anyway, keep your microphones off. Please stay in the room with me, okay? So we, 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 we move on as fast as we can. Uh, during the pandemic, the PSEG met uh, initially every week. Uh, starting in April uh, and uh, then every 15 days, and now we're meeting monthly. But during this time, we produced a, a document called Lessons Learned from the COVID-19, and that document is available and it was delivered to the WCO in June. And it basically talks about consultation between the private sector and customs, uh, transportation as an, in, in the inter need for international coordination of transportation, e-commerce, border release, the role of customs uh, and other border agencies, revenue collection, business continuity, human relief and crisis, and management and capacity building. I invite you to, to read this document. I'm not going to go into detail in this document right now, but it is, uh, it, I think it provides several of the suggestions which could be made during this panel in terms of how increasing resilience. I want to introduce now the panel and uh, we have the honor of having uh, Ms. Colette Hirscher, who's president of the Central Customs Authority of German. And she started her career in customs in 1991, and since then has occupied various positions in the Federal Ministry of Finance and the Customs Administration of Germany. From July 2016 to July 2018, she was Director General of Customs in the Federal Ministry of Finance. And since August of 2018, she is the president of the Central Customs Authority. I want to introduce Mr. Kang Chuan, who is the Director General for Science and Technology of China Customs. Mr. Kang is, uh, has, has assumed his post in September 2018. And before that, he has served as Commissioner of Coming Customs Area. Uh, I want to introduce Mr. Tom Sherwood as a partner of McKinsey and Company. Uh, and for the Middle East office of, of McKinsey. McKinsey. And Tom supports government clients on topics related to economic and fiscal strategy, government transformation, and data analyt and analytics in government. He has served public sector institutions in more than 15 countries on these topics across Middle East, Asia, and Europe. I want to introduce Mr. Agus Sudamarti, who is the Director of Customs and Excise Information and Technology of Indonesia Customs, who's going to be uh, our host for the next meeting. Um, and so Mr. Sudamadi has joined Indonesian Customs in 1991. 
and now he's the director of customs and excise information and technology of the director of general of customs and excise of the republic of indonesia before uh, his appointment as a director he was trusted as the head of regional customs and excise office of eastern kalimantan in 2016 to 2018 and last but not least mr sami zayani who is executive director of web fontaine and uh, he is the man he is managing the development commercialization and deployment of industry leading projects worldwide, including key reform work with Beni, Cote d'Ivoire, and Guinea governments. And we're gonna, in this session, I'm gonna give the panelists the time to respond to questions, which I uh, will ask now. And I will start with uh, questions specifically to those who are leading customs uh, organizations, the German customs, China, and Indonesian customs. And the first question is, which are the technological solutions that supported your administration in performing the customs functions during the pandemic and the ensuing lockdowns and travel restrictions? And I'll start with uh, Ms. Ms. Hersher, please. No, it's not yet. Now it's now. You're now on. it's working. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very very much. Uh, well, we uh, we had to react uh, rather um, rapidly on the on the crisis, um, and we had a wide range of technical and human resources measures to take. Um, Especially, uh, we were we were based on a already um, digital basis. We had all processes on a digital basis already in place. So, uh, what we could do in the first place when we faced uh, the the threat of the virus, uh, we had to to move our uh, the performance of our task on a, in a virtual uh, on a virtual uh, uh, basis back in the home offices, uh, which was uh, IT supported already. So the environments were there and the large scale of, uh, of our task were, were moved in the, in, the, in the mobile work. So we had, uh, we had reduced to the absolute minimum the attendance times in the office um, and all business trips, meetings, everything. Uh, was reduced uh, reduced to an absolute minimum, while services and clearance uh, procedures have been extended and were uh, more flexible in the uh, in, in in on on the field. And where necessary, we had to bring reinforce even stuff, bring people to the to the hotspots where the where the goods came in to, to fulfill their task by doing checks and balances. So we, we can say in Germany, we have most of the clearance procedures already uh, processed completely online, which made it possible to react that way. Nearly 100% of um, the, the clearance of goods in the traffic is uh, realized on an online basis which means 255 million uh, goods were cleared on, uh, for free circulation, transit or export uh, already digitally, which made it uh, rather um, not really easy. As I said, it had to be uh, really, really rapid, um, but it, it, it made it possible to, to bring most of our work in the digital um, area back to the homes and in the home office uh, out of our offices, which is uh, which was a very good thing and needed uh, to make very clear that our clear our staff itself, but as well as uh, the people coming to our offices, uh, were um, were in a secure surrounding, um, and this were this was the the way we reacted in the first place. Thank you very much, Ms. Hersher. And so I'll ask uh, the same question for Mr. Kang Xuan. Uh, what kind of uh, technological solutions supported China customs uh, uh, during the pandemic? 
，谢谢，谢谢约翰麦克先生。请往下讲。Thank you, Mr. May。新冠肺炎疫情发生以来。中国海关总署迅速建立了疫情防控的工作机制，采取了科学有效的口岸防控措施，同时结合疫情防控，保障国际贸易安全与便利，促进经济社会秩序恢复。In response to the outbreak of COVID-19, China Customs has quickly set up epidemic prevention and control measures. And take scientific and effective mechanisms. These measures will balance not only for the control and prevention of virus, but also for the safety and facilitation of international trade, and also for the resumption of work and production in an orderly manner. 疫情期间，科技手段发挥了关键的支撑和引领作用。Among the measures. Science and technology plays key supporting roles. 在此呢，我先介绍一下中国海关科技部门的职能，有助于参会者理解我们开展的工作。For your better understanding of our measures, I have to re、uh, re record.、Uh, yes. 2018年，中国政府进行了机构改革。将进出境检验检疫管理职能和队伍划入海关总署，因此，中国海关科技部门承担了科技发展规划、实验室建设和信息化建设保障等职能。In 2018, China exit entry exit inspection and quarantine duties and workforces integrated into China Customs. Against a systematic institutional reform background, therefore, the science and technology department of China Customs undertake the responsibilities of science and technology strategic planning, customs laboratory management, and ICT governance. 疫情期间，我们主要加强了三方面的科技工作，支撑和保障口岸疫情的防控。During the COVID-19 pandemic, we mainly take three aspects of measures. 一是加强海关实验室能力建设，疫情要求海关加强进出境人员的检疫、疫情检检测，同时加强对进出口防疫物资的质量监管。The first, we strengthen the capacity building of customers' laboratory. The pandemic requires us to strengthen the virus detection ability and improve the quality supervision, especially for medical supplies. 为此呢，我们加强了海关实验室建设，按需完成了实验室新建改建工作，配置了移动式的实验室、新冠病毒的检测设备，为口岸疫情防控提供了强有力的支撑。Therefore, we have strengthened the capacity building. Uh, of customer laboratory, uh, we have several customer laboratory newly constructed or reconstructed, and more mobile laboratories as well as rapid COVID-19 virus de detection devices are deployed, which providing strong technical support for the epidemic prevention and control. 二是通过信息化提升疫情管控的水平。推动入境人员健康申报多渠道的电子化应用，我们通过微信、掌上海关 APP 等渠道，发布了多版的健康申报小程序。Secondly, we improve the level of epidemic control through the digitalization, application of online health declaration app and applet for exit and entry travelers. The multiple version of health declaration supports the multiple languages compatible with multiple platforms such as WeChat and mobile customs. 旅客也可以通过一体化的申报终端等设施设备进行现场申报。For travelers, they can also make on-site declaration through the integrated declaration terminal. 
，方便快捷的无纸化申报，有效解决了纸质申报造成的口岸通道拥堵和人员密集接触。手写笔记不易辨认带来的风险和问题。The convenient paperless declaration effectively solves the risks and issues caused by paper health declaration, such as congestion of passenger pathway, intensive physical contacts, recognition problem of handwriting. We also developed the portable terminals for customer officers to conduct epidemiological investigation. Which greatly improves the efficiency. We also uh, update the legacy system to realize a closed loop management from health declaration, epidemiology core investigation to sampling and the laboratory. 30 we optimize our customers' online services. 不断优化互联网加海关，掌上海关 APP。I must give the floor to other people to respond as well. So, 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 不断优化互联网加海关 APP， 方便进出口企业通过在线方式一网通办海关业务，促进全面复出工复产。We optimize our apps so the uh, traders could uh, fulfill their declaration and their customer related business with one connection on the line. 谢谢 ，Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwan. And now, Mr. Sudamadi, can you share with us the experience in Indonesia? Okay, thank you, John. Uh, before I come to uh, answer the questions about using the, techno the technology, technology things, uh, we know as a border protection agency, customs always facing the issue how to balance the implementation of the prosperity approach for industrial facility industrial assistance, uh, trade facilitations, and revenue collections versus the security approach, yeah, community protector and law enforcement. In normal situations, it's already difficult. Yeah? We can imagine in this, uh, this situation, uh, of course, the ICT, yeah, information, communication, and technology become a big bone. But now, because of the pandemic, one of C uh, must be added to the ICT, ICCT, Information, Communications, and Collaborations Technology, yeah, to handle with the situations like lockdown, uh, uh, reduce the contact, uh, physical contact or something like that. Uh, in our uh, customs, yeah, we, to fa uh, for facing the, the pandemic issue for the lockdown and uh, work from home, something like that, uh, we released the mobile applications for the officer and also for the, uh, the for the stakeholders, so they can uh, do the business, uh, the cl uh, clearance process, something uh, clearance process directly from the, the the mobile. So they cannot, uh, they don't need to go to the office or to the customs office. Just send the document from uh, the, the the using the gadget. The second one we are using um, for the collaboration uh, issue. We are using the uh, microservices architect architecture of microservices yeah, using the API collaboration. So uh, we can connect, we can collaborate with other system without the uh, uh, need to do a contact, uh, physical contact. And the most important thing is uh, because uh, right now, uh, ICT is already advanced uh, so much, uh, the data has become important. So using the analytical tools, the data analytical tools is very important. We are using. Uh, luckily, uh, in, the, in this year, we uh, our data analytical analytical team uh, become a champion in the 
you know, the Ministry of Finance data analytical competitions, uh, meaning that our uh, analytical data using the technology for the customs uh, purpose already uh, implemented the, uh, in our system. The, the last but not least is uh, the machine learning. Yeah. Uh, machine learning process is very helpful, especially in improving the hit rates accuracy. So the customs officer only need to do physical checking based on the uh, insight from the machine learning that provided by our uh, system. Uh, that's uh, our answer about the first question. Thank you, John. John, we cannot hear you. I apologize. I've got to turn on my microphone. Uh, but I would like now to ask a question of the of the of the private sector. Uh, Mr. Sayani from uh, uh, Web Fontaine, and then uh, it, followed by Mr. Tom Usherwood from McKinsey. And that's from the perspective of providers of solution for customs. Can you outline the most relevant good examples of the use of technology by customs in the time of the pandemic? Also, what governments and customs could have done differently? Yeah, sure. Thank you, John. Um, so first of all, digitalized trade and regional integration are both critical to economic recovery in the post-COVID era. And we see this time and time again. Those that are already using digitalized approaches with improved practices following international standards are able to adapt faster and more efficiently. And those that were not were focused to adapt, I mean, were forced to, to adapt quickly to be able to maintain trade flows. When I say digitalization, I mean full end-to-end -end automation of customs and trade processes. The end-to-end -end automation is key, and the word end-to-end -end is crucial, as otherwise some of the manual processes will either hamper controls opening door to fraud or put people at risk during the pandemic. And a great example of this in practice is, is Bahrain Customs. Prior to COVID-19, Bahrain had already implemented this end-to-end -end approach, resulting in totally remote transactions including payment and a spectacular reduction in number of visitors to customs houses. This meant during COVID-19, users operating from home were able to process transactions and attach all necessary documents to their transactions. And importers do have the option to print the release note from their premises, but customs has yet to agree to this happening. So similarly, uh, all regulatory agencies and ministries can approve and deliver permits directly into the system. No more physical movements required and all operations are eventually centralized within the custom system, therefore providing full transparency and enabling optimal controls on control on the entire trade chain. And the full integration with and in the custom system is important. Uh, also reductions in staff resulted in fewer physical inspections, which is not an, an issue at all if risk assessment is optimal, uh, because post clearance audit can be very efficient. So at WebFontaine, we bring, the, we bring together uh, technology and expertise to ensure full end-to-end -end automation of procedures and efficient gathering and analysis of data. So having said that, uh, let me just provide you with uh, two examples of what I believe uh, could be improved. So the first example, uh, today the majority of existing customs systems are providing solutions to shift towards a paperless environment and to limit physical movements. But we often see a lot of sharing of scanned documents, which cannot be considered as proper digitalization. So the key is to turn scanned documents into usable data to be in a position to make optimal and fully automated controls. For instance, uh, advanced technologies to evaluate risk, such as uh, artificial intelligence, are very efficient ways uh, to facilitate trade while securing revenues. But to be efficient, these algorithms, they require a lot of data not scanned images of commercial invoices or packing lists or whatever. So we therefore need to couple the latest OCR techniques with artificial intelligence to reach usable data and to feed risk engine. And just finally, an, an, another example, I believe today we must be in a position to achieve a 100% remote physical inspection through technology. Okay, we, we may have one single inspector leading the inspection with equipment such as camera, sensor, etc directly connected to an online platform to which customs and OGA would connect. And then thanks to augmented reality, for example, inspectors online could immediately access to a single video stream 
complemented with data related to the transaction. So you could see data directly on the screen on the same video, thanks to augmented reality, such as the description of goods, etc. And eventually, a real-time inspection report could be created by the various entities connected to the platform. So these are only two examples, and a lot more should be done. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Zayani, and now Mr. Isherwood. Thank you, John. We've also seen a broad range of good practices adopted over the last nine months with COVID-19 um, in customs agencies. And some of the most obvious ones have been the major shift to remote work, uh, adoption of, a new, of new digital uh, processes, um, and also just operational agility, being able to move people around much more nimbly than, than you would in normal times. Um, and I think that some of the colleagues on this panel have given some great examples of some of that in action. Um, if you ask me that what has been the biggest challenge, I actually think the biggest challenge has been around data. And I think some of my colleagues here have mentioned the importance of data. Um, but one thing we've seen is that, especially in the last nine months, um, using data effectively in um, customs risk management has become harder for at least two reasons. Um, one uh, is that you have a, a much higher volume of e-commerce transactions. And so when you look at, uh, we've talked to some customs agencies that say, you know, as of September of this year, they had already logged uh, the same volume of e-commerce transactions as they had in the entirety of 2019. Um, these transactions come typically with lower quality data, uh, a lower volume of data. Um, and, and frankly, it's also uh, harder to analyze it all because there's just more of it and the actual transaction size is smaller. Um, the second challenge with data over this has been one that we've actually seen across industries. Um, you know, as, as you may know, McKinsey and Company, we serve not just customs agencies, but also private sector companies across industries. And one thing we've seen is that in some ways, COVID-19 has really shown the Achilles heel of analytics and data and AI. And that's that all of these techniques use data from the past and analyze patterns from the past to predict the future. Um, the challenge is when the future doesn't look like the past anymore. Um, and I think what we've seen over the last nine months is exactly that. What does that mean, though, for customs agencies that are trying to use data um, to be able to improve risk management? Um, what it means is you need to be able to, first of all, have more types of data that you can incorporate into your analyses. So it's not just declaration data, but it's also supply chain data. It's also uh, visual data using AI to analyze it from your x-rays or from your scanners. Um, and how do you actually bring all of that into one place so you can feed it into one uh, risk system? Um, in addition to more data, um, the other question, the other point is actually analyzing it with more sophistication and more frequency. Um, the models that have been trained over the last decade or the rules engines that have been built over the last decade may not work effectively today. But if you can use a high volume of data from the last three months, um, then you can actually have a much better view about what's actually happening over the next six months. Um, and so that, that's a bit about what we've seen. I think tremendous uh, achievements from customs agencies around the world in the last nine months, um, but a big challenge around data. Thank you, Mr. Isherwood. Um, the second question that I would like to ask, I would like to address all speakers, or I'd like all speakers to respond. And digitalization was the buzzword during the pandemic, but also equally important for customs and other government agencies were coordinated border management and the streamlining and simplifying of customs procedures. We witnessed some very good practices in the European Union and commendable efforts within the APEC. Can you share with us your thoughts on the importance of regional integration and regional cooperation in the response phase? And what should be the takeaways from the experience so far? And I'll start with Mr. Zayani, please. I'd ask for your responses to be as brief as you can make them. So we have a few more questions we'd like to ask, but if you take all the time responding to the first couple, we won't be able to ask the others. So please be as, 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 as concise I'll as possible. Brief. Thank you. Um, yeah, good question. Uh, you know, across industry and, and business, um, collaboration will be key in COVID recovery. Uh, Interagency cooperation is still underdeveloped, and I believe COVID will and should fast track this. So the key point here is that we, we know that technology can have a hugely positive impact on cross-border trade. However, if the, if the technology is not synchronized with correct organizational or institutional follow-up, then waiting times will not change. And some examples of this is that the concept first should be that a maximum of the data capture where the transit starts is shared throughout the transit chain. Also, some technological measures, such as tracking of loads and vehicles, 
offer a good potential for accelerating border procedures and inland verification, but customs often do not have the possibility, it could be organizational or institutional, to follow up on transit anomalies, therefore resulting in increased delays at borders. And the so-called uh, one-stop border posts are becoming the norm, but the way in which they are designed and operated tends to lead to juxtaposed controls, not integrated controls. So there is insufficient mutual recognition of findings. So exchanging information between custom system would be a game changer. And this is exactly what we do at Webfontaine, enabling custom system within a region to exchange data. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zayane. Mr. Sudamadi, what, what are your points of view on this? Thank you, John. With regard to the digi uh, digitalizations, our opinion, the issue does not stop in integrations, but we have to move further into collaborations. Yeah, Technology is now moving uh, towards collaboration where either the words of ICT become ICCT, info information, communication, and collaboration technology. technology. In 2007, uh, Indonesia has experience to develop the Indonesian national single window emphasize of the integrations of government's uh, licensing process uh, almost uh, 18 agencies uh, involved in the indonesian national single window through single submission single processing and single de de decision making in ict terms we call it this a uh, cross channel single portal but right now we uh, we need more than a single portal to do uh, uh, to do a collaborations wow Along with the development of technology, in, in, in addition to the choice of integration, which is based on the cross-channel, system is uh, developing what, what we call it the omni-channel. So custom system, uh, other uh, logistics uh, system can be reached wherever, yeah, uh, in uh, not using the single portal, but uh, cannot uh, able to, uh, to, to do the business uh, everywhere in uh, other, other, other party system. Uh, in this context, collaboration, collaboration means mutually, mutually connected, mutually connected between system without eliminating its other system. That's the, the keyword for uh, for us uh, uh, to do approach about the collaboration and integration. Uh, regarding regional cooperation, uh, our perspective is necessary to have a collaboration action uh, among custom system through uh, automated data exchange, for example, and streamlining of document and business processes using the ICT, information communication and technology. Uh, currently, Indonesia is very active in collaborating uh, G2G, government to government, uh, G2B, and accelerating also the business to business process by developing, we call it the national logistic ecosystem. If the national logistic ecosystem can collaborate uh, with the other ecosystem in other countries, uh, integration and collaboration uh, will become uh, realized. Uh, also at the regional levels, Indonesian custom has been collaborated with other custom system. For example, uh, we have a program with the Singapore and the Republic of China and also with the Korean customs uh, to do the data exchange uh, uh, for, for electronic uh, certificate of origin. But, uh, furthermore, uh, in uh, the future, we want to uh, elaborate the possibility of your export and become my import program, meaning that the doc export document from the other countries uh, 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 pre-populated become the import document. This is the uh, building the integrations uh, to uh, moving forward to collaboration. This, uh, that's our uh, perspective from Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask Mr. Schwan to... Uh, share with us his view on these this question. Thank你们,主持人。正如主持人所述,边境协同管理非常重要。在疫情期间,中国海关总署与口岸单位密切协作,通力协作,进一步健全信息共享的机制,打通信息交流的渠道,共享数据资源。you have just said, cross-border management is very important. During the pandemic, China customs work closely with relevant government agencies to share information, coordinate the procedures for screening, quarantine, and referral of passengers. Thank you. 
构建起多层次、全链条、立体化的联防联控体系。谢谢。With all the measures, we have established a comprehensive joint prevention and control mechanisms、uh, to contain the spread of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Chuan. Uh, uh, Mr. Sher, did you did you share your views on this issue? Thank you, thank you very much. Most of the things I wanted to say are already said. Uh, but I want to, to point out one thing which was really、um, essential for us as well.、Uh, we already have a very good uh, inter um, uh, um, uh, cooperation under uh, different uh, agencies on the border,、um, but we made it even faster and more streamlined. And I think really one thing、uh, it was、uh, very, very necessary to bring. Every paper out of the process because the paper will slow you down, and、uh, will do the contrary of what you you were intended to do to be very fast, especially when we are talking about medical supplies and all these sort of things which were、uh, really really、um, needed to to process、uh, very very fast. Uh, so uh, what what we did、uh, in the crisis, to be honest, we had some papers left.、Uh, when you're talking about origin papers, and we needed to to do the scanning, which is the first thing and, and, and fastest thing you can do. But we need to to work on 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 these、uh, on these pay,、uh, things. Uh, but we we had、um, crisis teams as well on a national and EU basis, which made it very very. Um, easy and 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 faster to to work together and find very solutions which are really really fast. So this is what we what we really、um, looked at and and and, and deep. But、uh, as I said, I'm、uh, with you of the opinion that we need to get really digital. <laughs> Otherwise,、uh, if you have paper in the middle, it's、uh, it's it's not good, not a good thing. Thank you. Mr. Miss, thank you, Ms. Isher, Mr. Isherwood, please. Thank you, John.、Um, I'll be brief because I think my colleagues have, have mentioned most of the really important points here, and I would just echo what they've said about the importance of collaboration, both interagency and cross-border.、Um, I, I especially love the point、uh, made by Ms. Hersher about the speed of collaboration, because this is something that we're seeing、um, across industries. Uh, we've surveyed more than a thousand executives、uh, in the private sector and in the public sector, and one of the things we're seeing is that processes that used to happen annually、uh, in good companies now happen quarterly, and during COVID sometimes happen monthly. Processes that used to happen quarterly during COVID sometimes happen weekly, and I think what we've seen exactly this when it comes to interagency collaboration. Obviously, there's operational collaboration that always happens, but how often do you really reset、uh, how that collaboration works? And change the operating model between different agencies. That's typically infrequent. In COVID, we saw that happen、uh, on a weekly or monthly basis, literally over the past six months, you know, continuously. And for me, the one question I would I would love to leave the audience with is, how do we maintain some of that agility after the crisis? Because、um, we could have used a lot more of it before the crisis. Thank you, Mr. Sherwood. I think.、Uh... The, the the themes that we've dis discussed right now all fit in with the safe framework of, of reference. Talk about collaboration between customs, customs in the private sector, and coordinated border management. Without that, we we really can't move forward. And keeping some of what we gained during COVID, I think, is critical. That's one of the points that's brought up in the in the paper that the PSCG wrote.、Uh, we have seen already some reversal to. You know, it's it's not in the law, so we need to go back to how it was done. Maybe we need to change it. Think about changing the laws、uh, to make it possible, right? So the I'd like to ask、uh, one more question of the whole group, and that is,、uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic has slowed down the achievement of the sustainable sustainable development goals. What customs and other border agencies need to do in the recovery phase to contribute to achieving sustainability? For people, prosperity, and the planet, how can we achieve a greener new normal? What, what role can the WCO play in this? And I'll ask、uh, Ms. Hersher to address that first.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> what can we do? I mean, we already spoke about, uh, I spoke about in the, in the first question, spoke about how we we can conduct our, our work in, in, uh, in the future. And I think we can take a lot of um, not needing to go to, to the office, not needing to meet personally in all the meetings we have to conduct. Uh, do that on a virtual basis, or, uh, or take your your home, uh, the, your work at home, which prevents um, many people from going day by day. I don't know, 50 kilometers uh, back and forth to uh, to to reach their office, while they can do same thing at home uh, in the in in the same in the same way. But we need to develop our IT systems, our digital information exchange as well. So um, we were, in Germany at least, I may say, we, we, we did some things which we didn't use to do when <laughs> before COVID. And as you said already, we need to, to bring, uh, if necessary, some laws into place uh, to, to, to have a basis on exchange this information in the same speed like we did now uh, in, in the future as well. But um, what you don't have to lose from our from our view is that we need we are, we are people. In the, in the end, we are all people, and we need to to see each other, to talk to each other. So we we have to have this in in our in our um, plannings as well. Keep some meetings and uh, leave the rest. Let's say, <laughs> uh, but in the meetings, we need to really meet and talk. Um, all the rest can be done on a virtual basis. Uh, there, we need to to see each other, to talk with, to each uh, to each other, and to have really an experience of being together um, and um, and developing new ideas. Therefore, I think we still will have to need to meet, and this must not be forgotten. Uh, on the other hand, as I said, we 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 really need to to take the experiences uh, out of the, the crisis into the normal, uh, which were made by uh, working even from home or wherever, uh, and you're not needing to go every, every day to the office. And then the ex information exchange, as long as we all have digital uh, digitized our, uh, our uh, processes, the information exchange will be the thing we have to work on. Thank you, Ms. Hersher. Um, I think meeting is a critical part of creating trust. There's an author of the 30s that wrote a, a book. Uh, he was inspired, uh, uh, Martin Luther King and others. And this is way before internet or COVID and the, how critical it was to meet and to have the dialogue. Otherwise, you work only on perceptions of the others. And it's it's very hard to create the basis for trust. And without trust, you don't have collaboration, which is the point that was brought up before. Uh, so Mr. Urshawit, please, would you comment? The, 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 the question is on sustainability. Uh, look, I think for me, the, uh, it, it's clear how customs contributes to, to the SDGs. For me, the question is, how can customs agencies achieve their full potential in doing so? Um, and if you ask me, what is the biggest barrier or, or uh, what are the biggest failure modes maybe, is that, um, so many of the technological advances that will help customs agencies to do a better job, um, it's stuck at the pilot stage and have trouble scaling up. Um, I, I work with a number of customs agencies and almost all of them have pilots around uh, blockchain, they have pilots around AI, they have pilots around digitization, they have, you know, and, and some of them um, and some of the colleagues on, on this panel have done a great job scaling some of those up in this crisis. Um, but the real question for me is how can we scale all of those up um, rapidly over the next couple of years? And, and the lesson that we learned from actually studying some of the private companies that have done this best um, is that this is not primarily a technology problem, it's a people problem. Um, and scaling these up requires a few things. First, um, it requires uh, moving away from silo organizations, that when the, the pilot is a, an IT project, it typically will end as an IT project and, and not go where it needs to go. Um, and so instead what we find is cross-functional teams bringing together people from IT, 
um, people from the ports, inspectors from the ports, people from operations, and you put them all on the same team and force them not only to figure out how do they play with the cool technology, but how do they actually translate this into at scale, a way that can actually improve performance of customs. That's when you get a real difference. And, th and the second thing we're finding is that also means that the, uh, the, the need to improve and uplift the capabilities of um, customs agencies employees, not just again, the, the specialists that you hire to do the pilot, but, but people on the front line so that when they get the recommendations from an AI engine, they know what it means and they know how to deal with it. And they, and they, they know also how to add their own judgment on top of it. Um, or uh, when you have new scanning equipment, I mean, all of these things, I, I think the same, the same thing applies. And so um, for me, what my, my hope uh, for the coming years uh, is that we can take some of the, the momentum um, of, of innovation that has really been present in customs agencies over the last nine months um, and translate that into scaling up the pilots that already exist um, to be able to improve the ability of customs agencies to contribute to the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Isherwood. Mr. Schwann, please. In terms of green development and ecological protection, China Customs has taken action such as strengthening the solid waste supervision and cracking down on smuggling of endangered animal and plant products. 我们注重科技手段的应用，一是研究固体废物快速的检测技术，二是研究采采用非侵入式的设备智能审图、大数据建模等方式来提高濒危动植物制品的发现能力，已经取得了一定的时代效效果。We focus on the application of advanced technology. One is to explore the solid waste fast detection technology. And the other is prior alerting on the smart recognition of the NII, uh, that means non-intrusive inspection equipment images, and also big data modeling to improve the ability to discover the endangered animals and plant products. Uh, as for the role of the WCO, we suggest the WCO plays a more vigorous role in the enhancing coordination and cooperation among the member administrations. Uh, uh, such as encourage the relevant information exchange and sharing in accordance with law, as so as to try to contain the spread of COVID-19 and other epidemics, uh, strengthening the international customers' cooperation, and uh, refrain from taking excessive measures against the movement of goods and and the crafts. That will ensure the security and safety uh, movement of global supply chain uh, and promote the sustainability for the international trade. That's our suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwan. And now, Mr. Sudamadi, can you share with us your views on this? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, uh, the issue, uh, thanks to the COVID. Yeah. Yeah, besides the negative impact on COVID, uh, COVID-19 is bring the positive impact. Uh, or when we call it the disruptions. How do uh, we deal with the new normal uh, change that our business using the ICT? But uh, the advancement of the information and communications and collaboration technology is useless if there is no trust, like uh, John, uh, John, say, John said. So the collaborations again, yeah. Uh, the WCO, I think that uh, can contribute more important role by arranging uh, more global operations, more global corporations and collaboration, for example, to detect and to the prevent the movement of hazardous goods, for example, and also the other uh, uh, 
uh, law enforcement effort yeah using the the, the technology because uh, by uh, with the uh, arrangements of from the world customs organizations we can uh, develop a trust yeah to connect our uh, system to collaborate our system the, the the keyword is again collaborations and the wco can play uh, a role a more role to uh, how to collaborate the system uh, among the customs institution thank you thank you very much mr sudamardi mr zayani please thank you chairman uh, I think a lot has been said, uh, and my answer was very much into uh, the same line as uh, Mr. Isher would uh, answer. Let me take a, a slightly different route uh, to add a few things. Uh, we also believe uh, technology has a huge role to play in this. Uh, the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development recognizes international trade as an engine for inclusive economic growth and poverty reduction and as an important means to achieve the 17 goals. So being the main enforcer of cross-border trade regulations, customs can ensure that international trade contributes to accelerating progress in achieving these goals. And simply to focus on one of the subjects uh, among all the goals, which is uh, uh, revenue collection and fair trade, which is really spot on with, with customs. So fair and, tr and transparent revenue collection and reduction in commercial fraud is key to supporting poverty reduction and support health and social programs. Ensuring governments are able to collect critical revenue is key to be able to fund crucial projects. So economic growth and job opportunities relies heavily upon these, uh, these revenues. So the way in which we use technology to do this is crucial. And for example, the way we calculate the classification and valuation of goods ensures all importers are treated the same way, creating a transparent and fair playing field and bringing more investors. So I, I wanted to emphasize more a bit on the on the, the use of artificial intelligence in this, uh, but a lot has been said. Maybe let me just uh, give you four examples of, of concrete things uh, on, on how to leverage artificial intelligence. So first of all, today we have, we have reached fully automated and very efficient risk evaluation. So there is no more manual work to, to do selecti selectivity criteria. And these uh, algorithms are trained by millions of transactions. And this, this really works well. We should have it everywhere. Secondly, we have reached precise and automated classification, also precise valuation of goods. Uh, and precise, precise and fair valuations is, is now automated. So, and more importantly, we can now detect fake documents, such as fake invoices through artificial intelligence. And this is crucial in the context of single windows and integrated software, since the data taken as input will be shared with several stakeholders and travel all along the trade chain, for example, from one custom system to another one in a different country. So we therefore need to ensure that the input is not fraudulent. And uh, one of the most recent achievements, to fin finish on this, uh, John, sorry, <laughs> is the, the auto capture, the automated capture of the custom declaration directly from plenty of scanned documents and plenty of different sources of data through OCR, but mainly through, our, through machine learning to ensure that data is properly auto-populated and operations are facilitated. So this works perfectly. So using AI proves to be a very efficient uh, solution to facilitate operations while securing revenues, which both have a positive impact on the sustainable goals. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayane. I think we have time for one more question if everyone responds within 90 seconds, okay? so. 90 seconds is a long time to provide news on, on, on uh, when you're looking to a news program. Uh, so it, please be concise. And the question is the following. The WCO theme for the year 2021, next year's theme, is customs bolstering recovery, renewal, and resilience for sustainable supply chain. So the question is, how can the use of technology contribute to recovery, renewal, and resilience? How can customs apply foresight in order to be better prepared and resilient in various disruptive scenarios? And I'll ask Mr. Uh, Sudamardi to respond first. Thank you, John. Uh, this is the interesting questions. Yeah. Again, yeah, I see I see still already there. Yeah. A lot of technology already there. The issue is how to connect, 
how to collaborate because in the uh, data era right now if we only uh, we have a mindset uh, silo mindset in our system that's useless uh, uh, using the the, the 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 new technology like uh, uh, like uh, artificial intelligence uh, machine learning and uh, data analytic things uh, that's why indonesia uh, have some uh, doing approach uh, doing a, a do a, a program and we call it the national logistic ecosystem we develop the platform that connect uh, logistic uh, system yeah uh, government to government government to business and business to business uh, connected and collaborative using the uh, platform provided uh, by the the by the uh, by uh, the government that's uh, how we deal with the the, the renewal and resili resilience uh, talking about the, the technology uh once again cooperation between customs institutions is uh, also uh, one important things yeah if we uh, only uh, advance in the our country but not uh, collaborate uh, do a collaborative actions uh, with the other countries is also useless that's uh, the my our point about this question thank you thank you very much and mr Schwan. Can you share your views on this particular issue of the, the, the theme for next year for the WCO? Theme for next year for the WCO. Thank you. 我认为, 首先是信息化对海关业务的全覆盖, uh, I think technology is very important. Firstly, I recommend the fully digitalization of customers' businesses and fully realization of paperless cross-border trade. With this foundation, the private sectors and people can interact with customers 24 hours a day and without physical contact. Uh, in the second place, the digital transformation for customers. That means re-engineering the customer's business processes and reshape customers' work patterns by application of new ideas and new technologies to realize the customer can truly naturally integrated into the international chain. That makes the doing business environment much easier. 2019, the China Customs proposed the concept of smart customs, smart border, smart connectivity in order to achieve the regulatory intelligence governance intelligence and cooperative intelligence. For now, we are working on the proof of concept projects with the cutting, uh, cutting edge technologies such as the artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, big data, cloud computing, we call that them ABCD. The goal is the modernization of customers' governance system and compatibility. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwan. And Ms. Colette Hersher, what's your view on this theme for next year of the WCO and how do we achieve it? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, there has already been uh, pointed out different sort of things, but I want to point out one thing which is really near by my heart. We already um, now have taken a big, st big steps during the, the, the crisis um, for more digital, digital, flexible, and therefore sustainable and resilient future. Now it is not the time to stop. We have to press forward. But and there's a but coming from my mouth, which is uh, not not so uh, not so often. Um, I think 
we we need to see that this is going going to be a marathon and not uh, 100 meters and you go fast and then they are there winner everything's good um Therefore, I think uh, these sort of, of, of meetings will be really, really needed to have an exchange of experience, see who is working on what, whether we will be able to share experiences, may even share solutions we found. Uh, and therefore, I'm, I'm really grateful to the WCO, which gives us this platform. And I think we have to do, need to do more, and we need to take the time for that. And um, not stopping, as I said, everybody's got his, his projects now, which need to be ready to, do, to be forced. But to see what others uh, made on an experience basis, we, we, we need to have that. And uh, therefore, I'm really grateful for, for the possibility the WCO gives us with such a meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hersher. Mr. Zayani, please. Thank you. So it's, um, I would say it's clear, those that are adopting end-to-end -end digital approaches uh, and recommended reforms are able to not only survive, but thrive uh, in disaster environments. Look at, at Benin and the speech of the general director yesterday, or Nigeria. These are a great example of this. And to be resilient, governments need to be prepared through technology, infrastructure, and processes. Um, digitalization needs to become not just a must, but a central pillar in government's approaches to economic growth and development. However, we often forget the importance of institutional reforms. They are key. Uh, think of the pandemic. Uh, some procedural innovations were mainstream. For example, goods were released before even a final declaration was submitted, or post-release checks sometimes became the norm, or payment or duties and taxes were, were, were deferred or sometimes waived or reduced even. Um, and even lighter tra trusted traders programs were put in place when uh, AEO programs could not be quickly implemented. However, these were really intended as contingency measures with the understanding that customs would revert to traditional methods once the crisis was over. So the challenge is now, as, 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 as Tom was saying, is, is now to ensure that many of these good procedural innovations are consolidated under a new clearance policy. Thank you very much. And Tom, since you were mentioned and you're the last, would you would you give me your opinion, please? Sure. Look, uh, first of all, I, I love the perspectives that were just shared by my colleagues. And um, I think if I just want to try at one point to build to it, that in addition to um, the technology, in addition to uh, the endurance that this will take, because it will be a marathon, um, I, I will also just encourage us to make sure we pay a lot of attention to the people side of this. Um, and I think that it's not only important to scale pilots, as I mentioned before, or to um, make the most of the technology, um, but the workforce side of customs agencies is actually going to come under a significant disruption going forward. All of the changes we've just talked about mean major changes in what customs officials have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of, the, some, of the, some of the things they used to do actually don't need to be done at all. And there's many new things that will need to be done. On top of that, we've also um, worked with a number of agencies and, and surveyed about 15 of them, where we found that in some of them, more than almost 40 to 50 percent of customs officials are also nearing retirement age. That will also be a major turnover and, and potential loss of expertise if it isn't managed in the right way. Um, and so I, I realize it's an ironic note to end on a technology uh, conference. But if you if you were to ask me, the, the thing that will make this successful is paying uh, attention to making sure we get the people side of this right to enable the technology, to enable the success of the customs agencies. Actually, that was a great concluding statement. Um, if, first of all, I wanna thank this fantastic panel uh, for uh, bringing all these ideas. I, I, I noted that when the council chair uh, finished uh, the first session of this, of this conference, he mentioned that customs community needs a global platform to be resilient. And I think it's not only a technology platform, it's a trust platform, right? And I think our real challenge, if I could synthesize everything that we've said, is that we, the challenge is changing our cultural, both not in customs, but in the private sector, from organizations and that have processes that focus on documents, from processes that focus on 
that focus on the management of information. And it sounds so simple, but it's so complicated to do that. To change from a mindset and where you need documents to a mindset where you need information to make decisions to move things forward, okay? And with those concluding remarks, I want to thank everyone on the panel for this participation. And I want to thank the WCO for giving us the opportunity. Thank you very much. With this session, we have picked up a number of lessons learned that can be used for the future. My brief summary, and it wouldn't be better than the conclusion made by our moderator, would be collaboration, interagency cooperation, and the importance of data and getting really digital. Before I hand over to Milena, I would like to encourage you to use the activity feed to tell us which form session format you enjoyed the most. Was this the roundtables, the panel discussions, or the one-on-one -on -one interviews? Thank you very much. Thank you, Viara. Uh, we are at the very end of our three-day TechCon journey, and we have certainly enjoyed it and learned a lot. We hope you have done so too. We also hope to see many of you at our next technology conference and exhibition in Bali in November 2021. And now I would like to invite someone whose support was very valuable throughout the TechCon. This is our Deputy Director for Procedures and Facilitation, Mr. Brendan O'Hearn. Brendan, please join us. Thank you very much, Viara and uh, Malena. Yeah, your work has been absolutely tremendous and it's greatly appreciated. Having participated in the last three days of TechCon, I've picked up many interesting ideas that I'll be discussing with uh, all of you and the rest of the staff. Before I invite the representative of our corporate sponsor, Ms. Melissa Odegaard, to announce the winner of the grand prize under the Find the Contraband game, let's first play a video from our corporate sponsor. Thanks very much. And let's bring on our corporate uh, sponsor representative. Hi there. I'm Christina. I am um, work for S2 Global over in Fort Lauderdale and I'll be doing the draw today. So if everybody's ready, 
Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, we have a Ruben Mashiri Kasiba. I think Melissa is going to advise um, which company they work for. But Ruben Mashili Kasiba, congratulations. Great, thank you so much and congratulations to our winner. Uh, and also a, a huge thanks to our corporate sponsor, Rapiscan ASE ST Global, for making this event happen. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. I would like to now announce the results of today's polls. Uh, regarding which technology solutions can best contribute to enhanced resilience in the future, by 51.6%, you chose electronic services. Regarding which topic provided you with the most interesting insights during TechDon, by 35%, you chose electronic services and paperless trade. I invite our Director of Compliance and Facilitation, Mr. Pranab Kumar Das, to provide a wrap up and to close the TechCon. Stick with us though, Mr. Das's pearls of wisdom will no doubt be a fabulous way to start the weekend. Dear participants, we are at the end of this three day journey, which has been an interesting one. Exciting, but not without few obstacles here and there. However, we have managed to overcome them and I hope you have enjoyed the 2020 WCO TechCon and have learned a lot from our competent and knowledgeable speakers. We are content that we have managed to maintain the tradition of holding annual WCO technology events, even during the year of the COVID-19 pandemic. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the sessions and the discussions on the opportunities and challenges faced during the pandemic on the use of non-intrusive inspection equipment and officer safety on e-commerce, electronic services and paperless trade, teleworking and building resilience for the future. We had over 1300 registered participants from 142 countries. I believe this is a record for number of countries in the WCO event. This is one of the benefits and perhaps positive fallout of these unfortunate times of the pandemic. That is an ability to connect from all around the world in a seamless and real time manner in all time zones all over the world. Now, I would thank all those who have contributed to the success of this event. First of all, my thank goes to Dr. Kunio Mikuria, Secretary General WCO, who not only provided the opening address, but led the high level roundtable discussion on day one. And second in line is Mr. Ricardo Trevino Chapa, our DSG in WCO, who led the roundtable today. And last but not the least, the credit goes to Mr. John Main, chairperson of WCO private sector consultative group, PSCG, who led the brainstorming session in the last session we all had. And I would also like to thank all those uh, moderators who have not only moderated different sessions, but also ensured that we have the one-on-one -on -one uh, telecon uh, conversation with uh, different uh, customs administrations and different international organizations and other stakeholders and got their views, their suggestions and their best practices. And I would like to thank in this regard all those speakers who have uh, taken time to join us and share their words of wisdom. This online environment has not only uh, for the many participants to attend, but also for many high level speakers to join us. Out of the 50 speakers, we had nine heads of international organizations and associations, eight director generals of customs, and three deputy heads of customs. However, we will still work harder to achieve a better gender balance amongst our speakers. And 
we have achieved 36% in female category and 64% in the male category. We hope these numbers will be better next year. Next, I would like to thank all those who have joined the sessions and made us uh, the efforts fully worthwhile. Thank you for being very active and enthusiastic and sharing your views and questions. This uh, event uh, would definitely not have been possible, but for the support we received from Korean Custom Service for, uh, uh, for holding this event and our uh, uh, credit also goes to the sponsors. I would use this opportunity to remind us as to who they are. RapidScan, S and E, S2 Global as our corporate sponsor. You saw the video, how dynamic they are. We have other sponsors like Nuketech, Crimson Logic, Microsoft, WebFontaine, TTEK, IBM, and Rikaku, our silver sponsor. I would also like to thank all our technology providers to ensure that we had this uh, tech, uh, tech con very smoothly and very seamlessly. I would also like to thank the interpreters, Louise, Lara, and the team, namely Jean Christophe Pierre, Jean Francois Michel, and Brigitte Mansungi for helping us better understand each other. I would also like to thank our events team and our technical support team who have worked very hard on integrating the two platforms, allowing for both English and French interpretation, as well as allowing for a large number of participants to be connected throughout the last three days. This was our main goal. So big thanks to Ludovic, Natasha, Scott, John, and Nick. And lastly, I would like to thank my facilitation team uh, by, uh, led by uh, Milena and uh, Viera, the professionals who have worked very hard on putting together the agenda and program for the TechCon under the able and dynamic leadership of my deputy, Brendan O'Haran. And uh, I, I, I hope you sincerely uh, uh, gained some of the valuable takeaways from this event and we look forward to seeing you again next year. The main takeaway I believe which has come out is that technology as an enabler can support customs administration and other uh, stakeholders in providing a real time collaboration and cooperation for a better and inclusive world. So see you next uh, uh, year. Until then, stay safe and keep safe and stay healthy. With that, I would like to announce the closing of 2020 WCO TechCon. Thank you all. Thank you.